Hi, Jason. How are you today? Hi, Michelle. I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm uh, I'm excited to interview my second man. And how amazing is it that you're an actor? <laughs> we can play off each other all day long. Okay. Okay, I'm up for that. I'm better with a script, though, just so you know. Oh, you are? Okay, well, I'm... And you're I'm better thinking... improvising, I can tell. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if we were to actually play uh, in a role with each other in a show or movie, you might actually go crazy with me, possibly. I'd be <laughs> like, wow, she's really not sticking to the script, is she? You'd be like, God, can she please stop? <laughs> You'd be good in comedy. Actually, it's so funny. So many people have said that. Um, when I left the corporate world, people had been recommending me to go do groundlings. And um, oh. I still think I want to do it. I mean, obviously, I don't want to be an actress. I mean, that's not obvious, but I don't want to be an actress. But I do think it would have been fun. I think it's just it'd just be an interesting experience, I think, and probably probably learn some life skills out of it as well. Yeah, that's what people say. I, I, uh, I think so as well. So and anybody that I know that actually has ever done it, uh, their presentations are just obviously next level because they're- You so have to think fast. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And it teaches you how to think on the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. That sounds like just my style. It'll, it'll feed right into my non-diagnosed ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same, snap. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Anyways, for all our listeners out there, I really want to introduce you to our special guest today. And as I said, he is an actor. His name is Jason O'Mara. And he has actually been referred to me by my dear friend, uh, Susan Kelly. And Susan's great friends with him and speaks so highly of him. And as you know, I only do referral interviews. So why not invite Jason on? And you know, I love an Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> Susan's the best, by the way. She's she's the best. She mm. she makes my life possible in so many ways. We support each other, you know. Yeah, and that's actually what I think is so beautiful about it is that um, it's truly a, a partnership. Like you guys each help one another in such a well. A our sons way. are best friends, like almost like brothers. So that this way we can kind of divvy up tasks and you know, drive, maybe not so much now because they're in college, but like driving and, uh, you know, entertainment and dinners and stuff like that, pets. And yeah, so and it's all of the um, above. All of the above. And, well, thank, uh, that's a that's a very blessed relationship to have. And we should all be trying to emulate what the two of you have developed as friends. So yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I wanted to introduce you by kind of giving a little bit of background to people about just how accomplished you are, because honestly, when I pulled up, like I told you earlier, I pulled up your Wikipedia, but I also looked at your bio and I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is, he's a true actor. Like he's done some amazing things. So um, you might know him uh, from such shows as Man in the High Castle, Marvel's Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Good Wife, Life on Mars, just to name a few, because honestly, the, the list could go on. I mean, we could fill two pages of Wikipedia probably. He's won an, an AFTA and uh, the Irish Film and Television Award for uh, the Netflix film, The Siege of Jadaville. Yep. Okay. And for the last 10 years, he's been the voice of Batman in the DC uh, Comics uh, original animated movie. So that's that to, to me, honestly, when I heard your voice, that's what I notably was like, oh, I recognize that voice from, from, from definitely that. And, but one of the things that I really wanted to highlight too is not only is he an accomplished actor, but he's an ambassador for Movember. And if any of you guys know what Movember is, it supports uh, men's health issues. And so truly he's got this golden heart where he wants to reach and touch people in ways that um, that's gonna help men move forward in their, their health. So I, I truly think that's a, an amazing, um, quality uh, of someone. In addition, um, he's he can be seen in the independent thriller that's coming out, Your Lucky Day. So if that's not a great introduction, I don't know what to say. That's very good. Exactly. I'm a little embarrassed, but uh, now I heard it, hear it all aloud. It's a little embarrassing, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, nothing to be embarrassed uh, about, only things to actually own and, and just seep into, because obviously you put in a lot of love of labor for that. So definitely something to be recognized. As in um, all times when I invite people to the show, I also like for them to kind of talk a little bit about themselves and kind of 
what I'd love to know is here you are uh, a guy that comes from Ireland and you know went to Trinity College and how did you get started like why acting you know did you have a inspiration was there somebody that you saw as a child that you were like wow I really want to emulate that person well, I was very fortunate. I had a I had a mother who was and still is um, uh, very enthusiastic about the arts, and um, she reads a ton. She sees a ton of theater, music. She's interested in cinema and independent film, and she's she's just she's just an amazing woman. So she would bring me as a young child, probably too young. Like I think the first film I saw was Barry Lyndon, the right. Stanley Kubrick, like. The second film was Jungle Book. It probably should have been the other way around. Exactly. But, yeah. But so that was the kind of stuff I was uh, exposed to from a young age. So I always had an awareness of it. And then I saw Star Wars when I was like five or six years old and it blew my mind, but not in the sense that um, I wanted to be part of that world. I wanted to be those guys who were getting to make that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be playing make-believe like they were. Mm. And um, but I didn't really know what that meant or how to express that. Mm -hmm. It was just a almost feeling. like an alternative universe, like kind of dreaming. I was just like, whatever they're doing, I want to do it. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. What right there is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're really in space or not, but whatever they're doing. So then I wanted to be an astronaut for a little bit because I thought that might get me closer. And uh, but looking back, actually, what I really wanted to do was was act and. Mm -hmm. um, and and play like that and yeah. ultimately get paid for it <laughs> exactly well, I didn't really know how to go about that in school so I I was kind of on a on a track to do science but I wasn't particularly academic I think I would have struggled in that department I was playing a lot of rugby and I thought well maybe I could do that as a as, a, as a profession yeah but even that didn't go professional till 1994 and um you could still argue it's only kind of semi-professional in some ways there's not a lot of money in rugby like there is in some of the other sports Football. but yeah for i mean it's it doesn't even compare um but i still i still love the sport and i i support it but i um didn't really have an opportunity to do that or take it to the next level and besides i was starting to get a little small for for you know to you play a contact yeah. sport like that yeah, yeah. And you kind of have to completely dedicate yourself to it. And by that point, I'd already discovered girls and booze. And, and there it was. It was like over. Things. It was kind of a... But by that point, I'd also done the school play and really enjoyed it. Like I got as much of a kick doing the school play as I would get winning, uh, winning a rugby game. So um, I thought, well, what about that? You know, what, what if I could do that? And the only... Um, course I knew of was at Trinity College and there were only 14 places for a drama and theater wow. students available and I thought there's no way so I didn't even bother applying that year and which um, county are you from in Ireland are Dublin. you from Dublin oh, okay yeah. Yeah. yeah so I didn't even know that that was the thing but then I decided to repeat my leaving cert which is like repeating your senior year Mm -hmm. um, so I could get some clarity on what I wanted to do. Because otherwise I was going going to go off to Maynooth University, which used to be a seminary and do science. And my parents wow. were like, that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad they- they Talk about like the opposite spectrums, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and they were going through their own problems at the time, but that they had a moment of clarity like that to take me inside a room and say, is this what you really want? Because if you want to repeat the year, It'll give you some time. And I think we think it would be a good idea. And I did. And it was a fabulous idea. I still played rugby and our team did very, very well that year. And I had another chance to do the school play. And by that point, I was playing the ghost of Hamlet's father in that play. Wow. And um, and the director, Martin Kelly, said he doesn't he didn't give out compliments, but he said to me, you have a wonderful voice. Do you know that? And uh, for whatever it was, it was like the right thing at the right time. And I heard it and I thought, well, I wonder if I have enough talent generally to kind of pursue this. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do an acting course because I knew how everyone would talk about how difficult acting is and how difficult an acting career is. And it is. It is extremely difficult. Um, but I knew I wanted to do theatre. So I did this drama and theatre course, which was not an acting course. Mm -hmm. but we had lots of opportunities to act in it. 
Um, but there was, you know, studying non-Western theater, studying um, great theater practitioners of the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, studying writing, prop making, production design, lighting so design. I gave you an uh, overview. Everything, like everything, you know, soup to nuts, drama and theater. And I did four years of that. And by the time I finished that, I'd done enough plays to realize and in every capacity, like every discipline, I was lighting the plays, I was doing the sets, I was directing, I was, but it was acting that really had, you know, I'd caught the bug by that point. And, um, and before I even graduated, I'd started. Was my it that role that kind of also helped you or was it the experience of witnessing like all the different types of facets within theater? It wasn't any one role really. I'd done um, a few plays by Eric Bogosian, who's um, a New York actor. He's done a lot of, he's done loads of stuff, loads of theater and loads of television. He was in Law and Order for a year. And um, he had a few one-man plays that I would um, perform uh, at college. And I did, did them as part of my dissertation as well. And it was that experience of going on alone on stage with a, an audience for like an hour and a half without an interval and just, you know, uh, experiencing that, 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 I don't know, it's just, it really turned me on and I just mm -hmm. wanted to do more of that. So I started working before I even graduated school. I got the lead in a, a play at the Irish National Theatre called The Man Who Became a Legend. And I just started working. And after that, I realized Dublin had got too small and I probably worked with most people I would work with. Um, not entirely true, but probably 75% true. I had met most of the people I was ever gonna work with if I stayed there. And I went to London and worked in London for seven years. And the first couple of years were really lean, like really mm -hmm. slow. It was lonely. I was broke, trying to get an agent, trying to get a job. And, you know, I even did a did a, a theater play where I played the waiter just so I didn't have to play one in real life, you know. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Like a couple of hundred bucks a week playing a waiter and uh and just slowly things started to I started to gain momentum and started doing some plays at the Royal Shakespeare Company and on the West oh, that, End that's and, a pretty big deal when did you land the Royal Shakespeare Company uh that was 1998 I think 99 okay. no 98 um we so did, did you school. know you wanted to stay in theater like was that kind of so you basically went to school did you know you wanted to stay in theater or were you like I'll take TV, I'll take, you were looking for an agent, but you probably needed a little bit more on your- resume. Well, I had an agent then by that point, but it was, it was really like, the only power you have as an actor is by saying no. So mm -hmm. you don't re, I didn't really plan anything. I think there are some actors who do plan stuff, but I didn't really have a plan. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I wanted to do good theater in London and I knew that, Hollywood was a place out there that would be fun to visit one day and maybe do a movie or something, but I had no real plan. It was just saying yes or no to the next thing. Um, and lots of television opportunities came up. So I, I took those. And in, in the UK, it's a lot, it's a slightly different approach. Like every actor is, you know, we're quite used to working in an ensemble. So mm -hmm. there isn't really that much ego, like, well, it's not a big enough part or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. I, I was quite happy to, just to do anything. As long as it had a sort of a, an emotional journey, mm -hmm. I was happy to play any kind of role in any kind of project. So um, do you think that you're the type of actor that really requires depth? Like in your dream role, like, would you like that sort of the, the real deep, like, journey? Kind of like what, because it seems from our conversations offline before we got on, there is this deep rooted spiritual person. Yeah, but I, I think that, um, you know, they say this, there, there are no small parts, only small actors. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think, um, I think that's true to an extent. I think you can, honestly, you can bring um, authenticity and depth to any role as long as there's an emotional journey. If there's no emotional journey, it's not really acting. And that's kind of a controversial thing to say because I think there are plenty of, you know, actors out there who'll do a part just because they get to work and work with others and be in something. But for me, that's kind of where it stops being acting if there's no emotional journey. And as long as there's an emotional journey, a, a beginning, middle and end, that, you, that you've changed, that you're a different person from how you were first introduced, mm -hmm. then 
there's an opportunity for for depth mm -hmm. and, um, like a transformation a transformation kind yeah. of like what we look for like what i look for when i'm coaching somebody is the goal is to transform some part of, part of their life right exactly so there's an emotional transformation but also hopefully uh, uh you know maybe even a physical transformation too i love i love trying to, i love getting lost in a role i love transforming i love being in something and someone goes oh is that that guy from that thing he looks completely different so um i like to sort of you know a chameleon is probably too strong a word but i like to lose myself in in roles when i'm given the opportunity i mean i played leading men for 10 years on American network TV. So you don't always get that opportunity to do that. But the older I get, the more uh, interesting the roles are getting, which is- You cool. feel like it's like you're being able to take bigger risks to, to kind of live out that emotional journey. Yeah, yeah. And I think I've always taken risks, always. I well, have always like turned that, down- you didn't have a plan, that usually says you're a risk taker. I didn't have a plan, but I did have the power to say no. And I've said no to some big, long-running network dramas that would have made me millions of dollars because I wanted to take a chance on this crazy thing or this crazy thing. And a lot of the times they didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Well, likely, I mean, obviously, it sounds like we are very similar in the way that even though you took the risk and it maybe didn't pan out the way you wanted, the 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 gift of the learning was actually in and of itself enough yeah absolutely and the experience itself the work itself mm -hmm. it all comes down to the work ultimately and well, the work it's itself your craft, right what's that it's your craft right your craft yeah or call it what you want but um that's really what matters and uh if the other thing is just money and wealth and success i'm not really interested i i it's that fly is really bothering you, isn't it? Really? Oh my God. It's like, what does he want from me? Did you shower this morning, Michelle? <laughs> well, the reason why my hair is a little messy is because I, you know, I worked out. Your hair looks great. I'm just wondering what the fly is after. That's He's like, I'm what doing. does the fly want? <laughs> <laughs> I keep saying to myself, I'm like, why is he coming back? <laughs> he must want something. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Maybe you should interview the fly. He might be more interesting than I am. <laughs> no, never. Nobody would be more interesting than you at this moment. So, um, I uh, what I'm curious to understand is like, so once you actually, how did you make it to America? Like, how did America? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. I'm just laughing I, because the way I said America is so oh. funny. I sound like a real American. American. So how did you actually make your way from the UK over to the US? Was it your agent or were you referred for something specific? Yeah, they, you know, pilot auditions started to come in for me uh, for stuff that shot here. And okay. uh, or, sorry. Yeah. For stuff that shot here. And I was in London at the time. And um and I was going up for them and sending them off, sending them tapes and stuff. And then on one occasion, they said, we've seen your tape. We'd like you to get on a plane first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and come and test for us at Fox. And the head of Warner Brothers is going to be there, Peter Roth and, mm -hmm. uh, and a few other big wigs and, um, and the director and producer. Uh, it, was for, it was for a pilot called Eastwick which oh, okay. never got made if the pilot got made but mm -hmm. it never got picked up it was picked up later for abc i think they did a version of it with other actors but this was me and um turned out to be chris evans who later played captain america you know mm -hmm. and um some other actors and um really good actors and we went off to vancouver the next day to make it and my a my current agent mike jolene at uta called me when i was shooting that and said Hey, I just want to introduce myself. I heard you're shooting in Vancouver. Next time you're in LA, I'd love to meet and uh, have a chat. And, uh, you know, I believe in people like that who are willing to make the first move, who are willing to kind of put their neck on the line. Because when I went back to LA, there was a bunch of people who wanted to meet with me because mm -hmm. I was sort of a, you know, no. It was like blood, like a new leading man kind of a thing from Ireland. And there was, at the time, there was this kind of 
maybe not obsession, but a, an interest in sort of non-American leading men. I don't know why, but there were a lot of Australians, Irish and English playing leading men on American network TV. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of falling under that category. And there were a lot of agents who want and managers who wanted to meet with me. And I took those meetings, but Mike was the first guy to call. Mm. And, and he's been my agent ever since here. There's so, been other fluctuations with features agents and other uh, aspects of my career, but he's always been my TV guy. Even when he moved agencies, I went with him. Yeah, it sounds like you have a loyalty thing. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I believe in that. Yeah. I'm not one of those guys who chop and change and try to jump on the next kind of, I just don't see the point. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's naivety. Maybe that's stupidity, but I just don't see the point. And I like him. I believe in him. And we enjoyed, we rode that thing, you know. Long time. Long time. It was like 10 years of a lot of fun where we got to choose what I wanted. What you to wanted do. to do. Yeah. That's a great question. And that's, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt you. That was to answer your previous question. That's why I came here and never really went back because there were all these opportunities all of a sudden. I'd be mad to go back to London at that exactly. point. Exactly. Everybody was like, Jason O'Mara is here. Yeah. We I was need like, a leading I was like, man. I was waiting for someone to say it was all just a big mistake. You know, it was just like amazing, just amazing moment where suddenly- Did it like, feel like a dream? It was a bit dreamy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I met my- um, ex-wife at around that time as well was she an and, actress yes and okay. we moved back to New York and um, we got married and had a baby and I think being in New York and then I bought a house in Connecticut I think that was my answer to you know the newfound success I wanted to be grounded and um, you know have a family life and it was a way of me kind of stating to myself this is how I'm going to deal with this sudden success like I'm going to stay grounded and be with my family do you um, feel like that was an effective way yeah in some ways I do yeah instead of being here in LA like it seemed more grounding to be in Connecticut because it seemed more like a stable family life yeah I often wonder what might have happened to me if I hadn't got married or had a baby and had stayed in LA and, you know, and I don't think it would have been great. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd be a little nervous. Well, that's the other thing. I've been sober since 1995. So that kind of lifestyle probably wouldn't have suited me. So yeah, just I like think the right that, thing to do at the time. And I don't regret it. Yeah. I think that it's interesting because I grew up in LA, right? I grew up in the Pasadena area, but still, I think there's always that phase and I worked in entertainment. So I, watched all these people come from different places and have such a strong desire to make it right and whatever that is whether you want to be an agent or you want to be on the distribution side or a producer actor whatever and you see how easy it is to get swayed into things that are not um healthy or grounding by the yeah. way isn't it weird that we're both wearing green right now it is a bit weird, and that I'm Irish. It's like the whole. We're trying this, to live out the day? Irish dream. Just it's missing a couple of pints of Guinness now, and we'd be off. I <laughs> gotta be so funny, except for you can't. Not for me, exactly. <laughs> except for you can't. I'd have to say no to you. <laughs> That's right. I'd have to cut you off. I you. <laughs> um, but um, so tell me a little bit about that. Like when you when did you come back to LA then? Like, did you feel like, okay, now it's time for us to move back or there were so many roles that were happening and it was like a fragmented lifestyle for your family? Yeah, it was starting to get fragmented. I'd just done uh, like nine months in Australia shooting a show called Terra Nova. And, then, and I also just completed another nine months of a show called Vegas um, with Dennis Quaid and Michael Chiklis. And that shot in Santa Clarita. So I was here yeah. and they were there. And it was getting harder. David was getting older and it was getting harder to take him out of school just for a pilot mm -hmm. season or just for the run of a show. Um, and, it, you know, we were just moving around and my wife at the time was working as well. So, and she was shooting in Vancouver. It was a lot of moving around. And I thought, I think we have to take Connecticut and the East Coast out of the equation or else we're going to be just in three places at once. And it's not fair on him. So, we 
moved back to LA then in 2013, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't so bad because then we'd have, um, you know, Vancouver or wherever we were working, but it was only a three hour flight as opposed to on the other side of the country. Ironically, <laughs> right as we were about to move, right, right after I bought the house in LA to move back, I got an offer to become a regular on The Good Wife. Oh, interesting. Which shot, which shot in New York. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. But that's um, life, right? That is so life. It's like, exactly, best laid plans. It's like we talk about having a plan. You know, it's funny because I talk about this a lot, that a lot of times, you know, all of us that come from the corporate world or from larger companies, we're so used to working off five-year plans, right? And in the end, the plan never goes to plan, right? So then right. you have to ask yourself, should we have an outline? Yeah, I, I think plans are great but only because it gives you some somewhere to start. It's a good starting place, structure. some structure, because if you don't have a plan, it's like a script, you know, I've, I've spent the last um, year and a half or so developing a, a feature script and uh, something I really believe in and based on some of the sort of emotional experiences of quarantine and, and the pandemic and stuff. And just that realization that you have to finish like, finish the script because then you've got a script that can be improved and and rewritten and made better but until that point you've really just got ideas in your head mm -hmm. and ideas in your head it's not such a great place for ideas ideas are better on paper okay. or you know something that exists that can be discussed it can be emailed it can be it can well, have that's a when it becomes real it starts to become real and then you can make all the changes you want but I know for me, just having stuff knocking around in my head is it's not a great place for them. Well, in order to be present. Plans are good. Yeah. The, the problem is living in your mind is not always the safest space, right? People think no. it is, but it's actually not the safest space. So, And I know um, that because if I write down my fears or write down the things I'm grateful for, it has it has a positive effect on my mind. Mm -hmm. So there must be some correlation between holding stuff up here and putting them down, put, getting them out into them, putting them in the world. Well, I mean, you're generally like, probably like 82% more likely to actually manifest them if they're on paper or if right. you have a visual that's associated with them or, you know, any of those. I didn't, I didn't know that that was the likelihood. That's interesting. You see, you, knew, you know these things. I've had to figure them out, um, you know, through trial and error. So it's interesting that you bring up the whole idea of writing the script. So the, the, the thing that I think is really cool about whether or not you're an entrepreneur, because being an actor in some ways, it is being an entrepreneur. You have your own business and you're basically trying to find different roles for yourself, right? But when you talk about like your original experience of, of being in that class and sort of seeing all these different components of being in entertainment, right? Or theater, do you ever think you'd be writing a script? Yeah, I did. In fact, I've left it to, I mean, look, I've, I've, written, I've written eight or nine scripts in the past. Mm -hmm. So I've always been trying to develop that skill and that discipline, but it's hard when you're working and you're, real life takes over and you know I went through a divorce um five years ago and so it's it's been a process and I think when you live a creative life it gets harder and harder to compartmentalize everything so mm -hmm. you know I want to live a whole life I want mm -hmm. my work to be part of my life experience I'm okay if it affects my mood and because I want my mood to affect my work, I agree. It, it, it lends some authenticity to it. Mm -hmm. And there are healthy and non-healthy ways to do that, of course. But so trying to, it made sense to me to try to write something where I could, even in an abstract or indirect way, get out some of the fears I had during lockdown and mm -hmm. um, that whole weird experience. And I think that's the difference between this script and the other scripts I've written. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's based on something, an actual like a personal experience. experience, as opposed to, you know, some cop who's got to take so down a bad Interesting, because it goes back to that word emotion for you. It's an emotional journey. Yeah. Mm, super interesting. So you mentioned like 
uh, discipline. So I'm curious to understand because I too am, um, have many writing things that I'm working on and cons consistently work on. But what I, I also feel, we talk about structure and we talk about discipline, like how do you encourage yourself to work on it? Like, do you set certain time or how did you complete it? Yeah, I mean, this is a whole thing with me because it's like this constant negotiation with myself and with real life. Ultimately, my what I'm aiming for every day is to sit down for a couple of hours with the with the script without distraction, you know, try and turn my phone off, turn the internet off, make sure my dog and cat have everything they need. I've returned all my calls and so no one's going to bother. So give it that in a disciplined way for two or three hours every day. That's what most, or at least in my experience, it's what's what most of the writers I admire do. They yeah. shut everything down between like 10 and one and they do three hours and then they're done. But they have the discipline of doing that five days a week or sometimes six. So that's what I'm aiming for. The result is that I end up doing you're like, yeah, I think I'd rather go work out. Nothing on a Monday. <laughs> yeah. Because by the time I work out and I do all the things, I return that there's no time left in the day or some crisis happens, then you're like, you know, having to prioritize. And um, so, you know, a Monday might go by and go, damn it, I didn't write today. I've got to write tomorrow. Tuesday, I'll sit down and I'll try and write, but maybe I'll have a bad day. And then Wednesday, maybe the same. Thursday, I might have an audition to prepare for. So by Friday, I'm like, wow, I haven't written anything this week. And sometimes I'll just sit down and start writing and I might be writing for like six hours. So I aim for the discipline of every day. Mm -hmm. and, and listen, there are some weeks where I do do that. I sit yeah. down every day with it for a few hours and everything goes great. But the reality is very different. <laughs> so, so it sounds like what you're saying is uh, you're giving yourself permission to flow. Well, I'm giving myself permission not to freak out if things don't go according to plan. Exactly. I have a morning routine that I also love that involves mm -hmm. you know, meditation and some journaling and a cup of coffee and walking the dog. And, and it's this, it's about an hour and it's just perfect. It's an amazing, hour. but it doesn't always work out. Mm -hmm. Trust you know, me. I happens. feel like I'm there today. I was like, I didn't get my morning time. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's annoying and it can throw you off, but like the real ninja stuff mm -hmm. is if your morning routine is thrown off and you can still make a day out of it. The Absolutely. real ninja stuff is if you didn't get to write today, but you're okay with it because you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get an opportunity tomorrow. Like that's the stuff for me that is really challenging. But see, like, I think you're saying, I think the flowing and being flexible provides opportunity sometimes and yeah. sometimes in our desire to be rigid or structured because I know I go through this too it's like both sides of your brain right you know what makes you productive but at the same time sometimes it's just the exact opposite what brings you success exactly kind of you know, having said that the most successful people I know do have a very strict routine and they freaking stick to it <laughs> Yes, they do. Yes, no, they that's uh, that's always. I'm sure you found that too. It's like absolutely the you admire the most. It's like wow. Okay, well, that's the secret of their success. But I can only do the best Jason can do. You know, I'm not Elon Musk. I don't really want to be Elon Musk. So exactly. I don't have to manage my time down to the nearest like five minute window. I don't the have. The beautiful part is that you're clear that you don't want to be Elon Musk. <laughs> it's okay. I made that clear. But exactly. the point is, it's like I think if you're living a creative life then the experience of your day can be part of your work. I totally agree. Because you can learn something from it and you can bring that to the next experience or the next project or- Yeah, and also the, in, in giving your, allowing yourself that freedom, suddenly you're implementing it into the script that you actually are trying to finish, that you have a yeah. block on, that you know, essentially you know, can't be completed because you can't completely articulate the thought. Exactly. So I went to see that David Bowie movie recently. Oh, I wanted to see age, that. Daydream. Yeah, is it good? I really enjoyed it, but I can understand how a lot of people didn't because it's 
quite an assault on the senses, mm -hmm. but I found it to be, you know, considering he was trying to make it as a kind of uh, a, a tribute to David Bowie's imagination, which is a very kind of a broad mission statement. Mm -hmm. I thought he succeeded really well in that. And since then, I was sort of going back into David Bowie's sort of back catalog and I was going down YouTube holes with David Bowie documentaries and interviews. And then that took me to Brian Eno, which kind of took me to Tom York, the lead singer of Radiohead. And these are all creative guys who I really admire. Mm -hmm. and I find them really inspirational. And it was Brian Eno who said that he thought that everybody should go to art school not to learn how to paint landscapes and portraits, but to learn how to um, how to do creative problem solving as a life skill, I agree. Mm -hmm. you know, and I guess that's what I'm talking about in terms of creativity. It's it's trying to bring that mentality to every real life problem to try to find a creative way of solving it, because something like filmmaking is entirely creative problem solving from start to finish. Exactly. The writing, the raising the money part, producers are really good at that. I, I wouldn't be any good at that. The directing, the acting, all the, all the a, a facets that go into it, they're all, they're all problems and they all need an element of creativity to solve them. It's interesting. I just uh, released a, uh, a post today that it was basically Ethan Hawk talking about creativity. And do you allow yourself play the fool or meaning like to learn from that experience, yeah. right? Because that's really what we're talking about is allowing yourself that freedom to learn who you really are. Yeah. Like, cause if you, you know, when you're talking about some of these uh, big name um, musicians, I agree. I do feel like you really learn the depths of you when you allow yourself to work on a creative project that you're not necessarily supposed to be good at. You're just learning. Because if we allow ourselves the freedom to learn, that's that's the gift, right? Well, sorry to go back to the Brian Eno thing, but he yeah. refuses, has always refused to be called a musician. Ooh, okay. He's not a musician. Me. Yeah. What does he call oh. himself, an artist? Uh, yeah, I think he's say? an artist. A or... lot of musicians call themselves artists. But he sorry, just- I apologize yeah. if I offended anyone. <laughs> no, 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 not yeah. at all. I wasn't, I wasn't saying it in terms no, of- No, I'm saying, saying it because-, because <laughs> I think it's interesting because to me, he's a musician. I mean, you know, he's produced like some of the best albums ever made and has had this incredible 50 year career and keeps reinventing music and uh, the ways you make it. And he's got this like incredible art installation now, the whatever it's called, something 78 million lights or whatever it's called. But he's never considered himself a proficient musician. And I just really, I love that, you mm -hmm. know? Because he probably is. He could probably pick up any instrument, but he would, doesn't want to, I think it's like he doesn't want to limit himself to that because mm -hmm. it's all about playing with something. Mm -hmm. Want to show up with a sense of play and it's like dress up. It's like being being a kid, you know? Yeah, I love yeah. that what you're describing. Yeah. They say that uh, that curiosity is the is the open door to play, right? And yeah. that so many adults lose the, Lose the, the desire play. to play. Yeah. And I, that's something I know that I commit to because I don't want to be like, you know, you, a word that actually came up when you were talking was about reinvention. And mm -hmm. I think about, you know, so much of this is female entrepreneurs and women, and so many women stop themselves and they become less playful. And uh, when I think about uh, what keeps us young, it, it's play. It's play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. exercise is important for the body but play is important to keep you keep you young that's stimulation mm -hmm. Imag stimulating the imagination exactly because when we act like we we don't you know like that thing terra nova there weren't really dinosaurs we we're working with a like a green screen and stuff and we had to imagine it was like being kids again like imagining you're being chased by dinosaurs and uh so many of these things now are shot with very little sets around them. And mm -hmm. you really have to use that sense of imagination. But we can do that in real life too, can't we? Oh, absolutely. I mean, certainly in terms of, um, you know, positive thinking and uh, yeah. creating, you know, visualizing a goal. Yes, uh, but creating scenarios to put yourself in places that you 
to create what you want. Like you said, you don't always have that control as an actor. I mean, you're kind of placed in a role and especially if it's TV. And you're placed in it with a group of people too that you don't get to choose. It's kind of like family. Exactly. And then you have to become a family. So speaking of yeah. like imagination, yeah. it's like, well, how am I best going to understand each person so that I can uh, have the best, the healthiest family, right? Yeah. And, um, but I believe, and it sounds like you believe the same thing, that we have to try to create scenarios best for ourselves so that we operate optimally, right? Yes. And it sounds like from what you're describing from the screenplay that you wrote, that was based upon fears and stuff that were created during COVID that we weren't operating optimally. Correct. Yes. Which is freedom. Yeah. I mean, it's it's funny because I wrote... I wrote a piece for Movember about how quarantine doesn't necessarily mean isolation, that isolation is a choice. And that's true. That's true to an extent, but it still has um, an effect, you know, like even though we're doing Zoom now, I much prefer in Being person. In person. And, and I'm trying well, to deliver. When you get me of, this set, <laughs> when you get me this set, we'll be all set up for that. <laughs> I'm really fine with Zoom. I really am. <laughs> no, you but, know, I actually... Before COVID, I used to work out of this workspace and there was a podcast room. I've thought about moving back to that. Conveniences, I'm telling you. Yeah, but it's just, you know, it's just trying to get that. I think magic happens when people are together in a room. Well, it's interesting because I think it's funny. I'm working on this blog post right now. You, you mentioned text messaging. Uh, it's basically about the ellipses, the, the ellipses, the dot, dot, dot because we all live in this world of uh, quick, fast communication, thinking that it's actually uh, more efficient, but in turn, what we are both saying is actually it lacks the human connection. It lacks uh, intonation, so much of what connection is based on. I would say have the courage to actually have a hard conversation, right? And it doesn't yeah. mean that you have to agree with each other, just have a hard conversation and air it out and move on. Or, Do you think you stay relevant by not you or one stays relevant just in general by remaining playful and wanting to learn about like other generations that are behind us? I just think the best way is just to do the best work you can and just either either take good opportunities or create new opportunities for yourself. I keep keep working somehow and keep yes keep the playfulness keep the creativity going like mm -hmm. one of the reasons I started the script project was because um, I, it was quarantine and I wasn't working as much I, I did a couple of things actually surprisingly but um, there was still a few months in between jobs and I didn't want the creativity to stop stop just because the phone stopped ringing mm -hmm. you know and I think that's really important so if you're talking about relevance you're not relevant if you're not if you're not exercising that part of your brain that doesn't that makes you feel irrelevant mm -hmm. you but can't as long expect as it to just come to you you have to actually take action i think so. personally i had to take action yeah but for me it had to be creating like cultivating and, and supporting that creative part of my brain so i felt like i was creating and doing something and having something to show for that time at the end of it Mm -hmm. um, now, whether that project ever gets made or it makes me relevant or it becomes a zeitgeist thing or it doesn't, whether it makes a million dollars or a bazillion dollars or loses money, this is all stuff I'm beyond my control. So mm -hmm. relevance is beyond my control, too. All I can do really is position myself so I'm ready when the opportunity mm -hmm. comes and keep that part of my my Brain opening. Opening my brain open. going. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about Movember. How'd you get involved? How does one get involved? How do we support that uh, part of your journey? Um, I love the fact that you're involved with it because I, so many men, we talked about this before we got on the call, but so many men don't talk about their ailments or don't have the support system or network to help them move through some of the greatest challenges in their lives. Talk to me about it. Yeah, so Movember is, it's a global men's health charity, right? And 
Movember takes the premise that men's health is in crisis. That's a global problem. There are issues like 10.8 million men are currently suffering from prostate cancer in the world. 69% of all suicides are, are men. And why is this? Why is a man uh, more likely to live five years less than a woman? Um, so it's, these are pretty big questions and they consider themselves unique, uniquely positioned to be able to uh, address some of them best they can. I thought it was an interesting opportunity. I was looking for some uh, something philanthropic to do and I was really <laughs> tempted to start working for, you know, cat and dogs homes and I'm an animal lover and I wanted to, you know, support no kill shelters and all that stuff. But my stepfather had just passed from uh, cancer. And um, when I was looking and doing my research and I was talking to a publicist actually who was helping me kind of open some of these doors for me and, and help me find the right place that was a good match for me. And she she suggested Movember and I went and met them and um, and it, it really appealed to me. Um, I think I think also because, you know, because of my sobriety, which means I've been on a sort of a spiritual journey for most of my adult life. And um, so the idea of supporting mental health, supporting physical health, exercise, eating well, but also supporting this idea that men should talk to each other more and talk to their, um, just talk more, <laughs> communicate. communicate more, go to their doctors, talk to their Girlfriends, wives, boyfriends, husbands, sons, daughters, everybody needs, to, you know, men need to communicate more and be okay with the fact to say that they're not okay and that they need help, you know? So it's really just just that, you know, to try and get men opening up more because we, we all feel at Movember that if that happened, that lives would be saved. Oh, definitely. Okay. I mean, it's certainly the starting point of, of lives being saved is for them to feel like they have a safe place to communicate. So so what do you do during November? I mean, you grow a mustache, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I was hoping I'd see it. But so the first thing you can do is go to Movember.com and see how you can get involved if you want to take part or if you want to donate. Uh, there's loads of ways of getting involved, first of all. The way I got involved is I've sort of become an ambassador. So I'll put stuff on social media. I'll show up to Movember events um, and just generally chat about Movember and my passion for it with you or anyone who's interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, so usually, traditionally, what we do is uh, we shave down on November 1st, which will hence- I Shave down just your face? Shave your face. Yeah. Okay. Not, not your entire body. No, that's, that's weird. Michelle. <laughs> I'm so glad you're not running the Movember foundation. It just be a bunch of hairless guys running around for a month. Uh, I thought it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> just like Michelle's telling me, I don't know. It's just, everything's coming off. Um, okay. So yeah, you shave your face. You shave your face. And then every time you shave after that, you leave the mustache. You can grow like a long sort of handlebars, a little tiny thing. Some kind of, you know, top lip facial thing, but no goatees, no beards. It has to be quite, tiny. A little bit quite strict because that's what sets us apart from guys who are just not bothering to shave for a month. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is to create a talking point. So someone goes, oh, you got a mustache. Oh, you're, are you part of Movember? And you can talk about it. And then you can say all the things that I just said. And, and how why. large is the organization? How large? Yeah. How long has it been around? Jeez, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't know. You'll have to look yeah. that up. I how don't want to, been involved? I can take a guess, but I don't want to guess it. It's so. okay. I'll look it up. How long have you been involved? I've been involved since about 2015, 16, okay. so about six, seven years. Very little long time. Yeah. It's been around longer than that, though. Okay. And it started in Australia. I know that. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. And, uh, and spread from there. Okay. Um, well, it's good to know because I think uh, it's important 
you know, I'm all about supporting all people. And I think that, um, you know, so many women have husbands and or fathers or sons, you know, that have experienced um, some form of cancer or mental health crisis. Exactly. So to help men, I think is a very important thing. And also those statistics that you listed are rather staggering. So 69% of men committing suicide is really high rate. Yeah. So I do have one last question for you. And I end this uh, on all my interviews. And I'd love to understand what your top five core values are. Whoa, whoa, what? <laughs> my what? My what now? My top five core values? Yes, it's in the list of things that I offered to you. Oh, I never read the list. <laughs> my top five core values. Okay. Well, I can I, for you if you want, because I heard him during the interview. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I will say, well, maybe we can collaborate on this, but I will say that I believe in showing up. Mm -hmm. Integrity. In, right. So if you say you're going to show up, show up. So if that's, you call that commitment or whatever, but, but actually showing up is one of the most, uh, one of the strongest, most loving, one of the, it's, it's a strong statement that you're making. It's like, what more can you do except be physically present with someone or something mm -hmm. or some cause or it's like showing up to that, which means you should probably make your bed. It means you have to like shower and put on fresh clothes. And I know this all sounds basic, but no, these are all things that lead to they're called habits and routine. They're all habits and routine. Back to our original conversation about structure. Right. So it Successful enables people. you to exactly. Yeah. It enables you to show up. Mm -hmm. so that's why showing up's important. Um, what did what did you hear? Uh, so I heard integrity, I heard loyalty, I heard creativity, yeah. I heard um, kindness, fun. kindness, kindness is so important. I know, you know what, I feel the same way. I just said this in an Underrated. interview. I feel like kindness is undervalued and I feel like, yeah. So I love that. That's what we're talking about with, it is not kind to leave someone hanging whether it's a work thing or a personal thing or even a romantic thing, don't leave someone hanging. Just tell anything's better than nothing. Yes. You know what I mean? Tell them to F off. At least you have an answer. Exactly. Well, I mean, but that takes courage. Yeah. So if you are a courageous person, truly, and you show up and you have integrity, like you're saying, you will, you will deliver the information in the kindest possible way. Yeah. Exactly. So you're not looking to actually hurt someone. You're just looking to actually be honest. That's another but, one of your values. But truth, is, but truth is kind. Truth is a kindness. It can be brutal. It can hurt. But it is ultimately the kind thing. I agree. Holding the truth, lying or lying by omission, that's not kind. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, I love to hear... Um, all of those things that you just listed are all things that I heard during your interview. So, um, so that everything that Susan said about you, I'm just going to kind of cross it off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Meaning like she said a lot of bad things about you before we got on the interview. So did I get the job, Michelle? Do I, I don't know. This is a job interview, isn't it? This is a job interview. Of course you got the job. What do you want okay. the job of though? Because there's plenty of jobs to have around here, by the way. I'll tell you what, my, my first job will be to stop whatever that dinging sound is. What I know, heck? I have to tell you because normally my uh, computer is actually noted that I turn those uh, signals off. Wow. Ugh. And wow. it's like these people, they just keep coming. <laughs> what do they right. want? At least they're not ghosting you. No, exactly. Thank God for that. But um, I would love for people to be able to reach you. First of all, I want to thank you for your time. This was really fun. Uh, thank you. It flew by. What it a, what did a fly time. by. I mean, I could talk to you for a long time. I still have a lot of questions, by the way. To be continued. But, but I think um, I like the fact that you like to process. Yeah. Like a true actor. Yeah, yeah. I you have to. process through your, your answers, which I love. Anyways, uh, so I'd love people to know where they can find you if you're open to that and um, that they can ask you any questions that they might have. Sure. My cell phone is, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> my, my, uh, my Twitter is at Jason underscore Omara. 
mm-hmm. I think. And my Instagram is at Jason O'Mara official. I'm on Facebook too. I can't remember what I am on Facebook. It's Jason O'Mara anyway on Facebook, but please come and join. And I'm not always great. Like sometimes I take sabbaticals from social media because sometimes it really does my head in. And recently I've had like a bunch of people pretending to be me. And every time I log on, I'm just having to tell people to report and block these. You know, that just happened to me last week. It sucks. It just, it makes it just so much less fun. You know, you know what's really weird? It was like empower he. It was what? It was the 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 handle that they used was like empower her he, like underscore he. Ah, uh, yeah, it's it's the same, but slightly like sometimes they'll say Jason Omar official with two L's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they'll have two F's or or three F's or like it's so weird. I don't the get. The thing is, is that you can't you can't get rid of them. I mean, they're just. If you report them more often than not, they'll they'll be blocked and report and they'll shut they'll shut them down. But sometimes, you know, they're like. Instagram will say, well, he's not really pretending to be you. He's, he's uh, pretending he's a, he's a fan account. And you're like, well, he's using my name. He's using my likeness. He's not saying that he's not me. So what do you want me to, you know? God love Instagram. Yeah. So, um, anyway, come and join the party (laughs) over at Instagram. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. And I know we'll be speaking soon. Thank you, Michelle. It's been an absolute privilege. I appreciate it. A lot of fun.